Alright then, uh, welcome back to Assassin's Creed 4. We've got a bit of a problem. Oh, by the way, that's the Forsaken book. Oh, that's hilarious. Um, so, I recorded the rest of the game, at least until the part where you kill Loriana Torres in the Observatory. And while I would love to just explain it so I don't have to play that mission again, I feel like I should. Um... But at the same time, it's annoying, because... Uh, it's just annoying. Everything recorded, but the sound stopped. Like, the sound was not working. You could hear me, but everything people were saying, all the music in the background, you could not hear them at all. And so, I'm sorry. But, <clears throat> I do have footage of the event, and I'll be edit editing them on over the top of this, so you can see what it was like, and basically how the mission goes while everything is being playing in front of this. At the moment, I'm in um, Stogo Industries as me, as the main character, sort of, just walking around, but I'll be explaining what happens while I put video footage underneath. So, from where it ended off last time, we basically sail off back to Africa, or as it's called, Princeite. And we're hunting down the sage. <clears throat> we get onto this island, and after going through the island enough, you get to this part where Robert is. And it really annoyed me, because I was going to originally just hide and kill him from afar with a berserk dart. But... <clears throat> Once he notices you, he instantly recognizes you and runs for a ship, and you have a countdown. And so, it tells you to get to the jackdaw's wheel, but the jackdaw's wheel is far away. And next thing you know, the jackdaw comes in, you're on top of a cliff, so you have to jump off. And so I wasn't sure where the jackdaw was going to stop, and so I lost the timer, and I had to redo it. But then, he blocks a path, because he's on a ship. And you have to go around, and you have to make his ship go down. And you can't make it go down until you're in this area with lots of ships. So take down all the ships, take down his ship and you board his ship, and the objective thing for that, the optional objective, is using a rope dart to kill him. So in that case, I got up to the lowest flagpole, got him with the rope dart, I got shot off a few times, but then I hanged him, and I find it funny that you could kill him by shots, you could kill him by rope darts, which is what the optional objective was, but in the end, you'd kill him with a hidden blade, and I actually have a theory about what that is about, but I'll explain that later on. Um, but you kill him, and he gives you the skull back, and he actually asks you to burn his body so the Templars can't get him. And I think the reason he wants that is so the Templars can't use his blood to get in. Um, and you use the crystal skull in the next mission where you find Rona. And if you remember Rona, she was in one of the Templars who we had to and we had to kill a person called Flint, and those two loved each other. And, um, Rona has the skull, because you're going to go hunt down L L um, Luniano Torres, which is the old man who you gave the map to at the start of the game, pretending to be Duncan Walpole. And you actually find out that the blood you used, and um, the blood vial you used to track down Luriano wasn't Luriano's blood, it was his body double. So when you go to kill Luriano, you actually kill his body double. And remember that guy in metal armor who protects Loriana all the whole time, you end up killing him. Um, the optional objective for that one was shooting him with, um, no, not shooting him, uh, was using two people's human shields because the, the guard shoots people a lot. But I ended up killing him with about four or five pistol shots. I ended up killing him, I ended up shooting him twice, and then I ended up shooting him with like four more in the headshot. And then he died finally. Um, the guy didn't speak, but Edward was saying how um, that that guy had punished Edward so much that it turned Edward into a different man, into a more respectable one. And he's like, die knowing you turned a scoundrel into a, um, into something else. <clears throat> and then he ends up closing the guy's eyes and said, rest in peace at the place of, place of the dead. So he was being nice, but at the same time he was cursing the guy. And you find out that Loriana is actually going to the observatory right afterward. Edward already knows that. And so you end up going to the observatory island where Loriana was, and the optional objective for that one was save guardians. I, ended up, I only end up saving five out of seven. Um, because I couldn't find the other two. 
And another objective was you end up going into the observatory and you find out Loriana has activated this self-defense thing, which causes these beams of light to shoot out of the gaps in the walls, some of them at least. And they burn anything they touch, at least anything that's living, because it doesn't hurt the surroundings, like the walls and stuff. I'm guessing that's why the walls are made out of that black material, because they're immune to the light. Um, but you end up having to climb all the way up, and it's very hard to sometimes, because the lights are on, and then they're off, and if you accidentally go in the way of the light before they, um, right as they turn on, you get, like, the ones on the wall don't, don't burn you. They make you lose your grip and make you fall, but the ones at the bottom, they, um, they burn you to a crisp. But then you get to the top, and you air assassinate, or you can berserk dart, or you can shoot whichever one you want, I air, I air assassinate it. Um, Leonardo Torres. And I don't really remember the conversation between Leonardo Torres, but I think it was something among that, um, Leon, Leon, um, Leon, Leonardo, Leonardo? Leonardo Torres, yeah. Um, he was mentioning how, um, Edward has lost everything, he has lost his family, he has no future anymore, and how... Even though he's killed the Templars that were originally going to go off to the observatory, nothing has changed. And Edward's like, um, I see this as a mission complete kind of thing. Um, how he, um, Torres wanted to turn the world into a prison where people were free, um, where people were at peace and stuff, but they were forced out of reason. And that wasn't how it should be. And Torres ends up dying. And then everything goes back to normal, the defences are turned off, everything goes back into place, because, all, because the whole observatory was going psycho, everything was in the air and stuff. And so Anne comes in along with um, along with Uptai, who is the Master Assassin, as well as Adewale. And Adewale ends up calling the place Captain Kenway's Folly. So you put the skull in the place, and Aptai, Aptabai, says how he will close the place, throw away the key, though I don't think there's a key, I think that was just a metaphor, and that it won't be opened again until a sage is found again. And that's where the Animus part ends. Now, the next part is when you wake up in... Now, this is the fucked up part. You wake up in the present, and John the hacker, is in front of you, and he's a sage. He has the same face as Robert, he has the same voice, and the reason you can't figure this out before, unless you are very clever, is because when they're talking over communicators, his voice is slightly different. But I'm sure some people might have been able to work it out, but I didn't, and I was really surprised when it happened. I didn't remember that, that part from when I played it before. But basically what happens is he has this blue syringe, and the doors end up getting busted in, but he injects you with a syringe, which makes you go all sleepy and stuff. And he ends up um, saying, before everything happens, before the, uh, the doors get shut in, he says how he's lovely Juno. And remember how I mentioned... Oh, wait, no, you wouldn't have mentioned... I've known that because that part of the video, the sound, I have to edit it out. But basically in the observatory mission, where you hunt down Loriano, I got a letter... I found the last letter, it's number 20, and it basically explains how Minerva was talking to the sage, how um, something will happen. I didn't read all of it, but Minerva was talking to the sage about something during the year 1706. Or maybe it was him remembering something, I didn't really read it properly. But so I originally thought the sage, when, um, when Robert said he wanted to see her again, I thought he meant Minerva, because of that letter. But due to what the sage said in the present day, the present day, not in the Animus, he originally was talking about Juno. He wants to see Juno again. That's why Juno showed up in the last Abstergo moment, last, like, in the real world place. That's why Juno appeared, because John wanted Juno to take over the main, like, my body, your body, the main guy in the story's body. And so she can be, hu like, not humor, so she can take over someone and be in the world properly. And John only wanted that because he wants to hear her say his name and stuff like that again. He wants to be useful her, to her, to the precursors. Um, but, yeah, he ends up getting shot by the bodyguards. He goes to shoot one and he purposely has them shoot him because he wants to die. Um, because he knows he'll just be reborn again. And Melanie, the red hair girl, comes in and 
she protects you. And when you wake up in her office later, she actually says how all the data they found was pointing at us, the hackings and everything, but then they found that it was John all along. So I'm not sure if they knew it was actually us, or maybe they thought it was John blaming us, but either way, we're out of the clear. Um, she did give us a video, a trailer of all the work we've been through, a trailer for the movie they're going to make out of the stuff we found, but for some reason my game won't let me watch videos, so I can't watch that. But that's literally all that's happened so far. I'm hoping that the videos I put over this of my past recordings actually explain a bit how the missions went. Um, I am sorry that the music, that the video, uh, that the, the backgrounds, um, the background music was, this background sound wasn't working. I don't know why. Like, the start of it was, and then once I started the, the mission, it just went out. It wouldn't work. But, yeah. Um, we're not at the end of the game yet. Yeah, we killed the last Templar, but there is still an ending scene left, and I'm going to make sure that the sound works before I play it. So otherwise, I will be right back. Alright guys, I am back again. Um, I showed it to you in the video I just did of me explaining the events we've just gone through, and I'm hoping, I'm really hoping, you guys don't mind that I could go back and do the missions again, but I really want to get on with this game, and while I would love to play them again, I feel like that what I've showed you is literally all that's important. The rest of it was basically me tailing people to my target, and trying to get to my target by going through the observatory jungles. There wasn't really much else to do. Um, those were the big bits, I reckon. So, hopefully that was good. I don't think I missed everything. I missed anything. But there is one thing I did miss. Um, I showed it to you in one of the scenes, but Edward gets a letter from Aptabai, and that letter, I'd never explained it. He explains how he, um, but it was the blood vials. Remember how Robert mentioned there were blood vials in the observatory of all these ancient people? Turns out, they're missing, and I forgot to bring that up, but that's not all. Edward says he will help find those blood vials after he fixes things from home. That's when Abtabai gives him the letter saying it arrived a few days ago, and all we see is Edward's face go all sad. So I feel like it's going to continue on to what that letter is. I think Caroline died? I don't know though. Honestly, I'm not even saying that. I don't know the ending of this game. I've forgotten it. I don't know if she dies. I don't know if she was pregnant. I'm not sure what the hell's going on. I'm really desperate to find out though. Though I like this. Look, 93%! Yay! <laughs> I am happy to see that number. So yeah, time to finish this game. Finally. So, before we do that though... Uh, oh yeah, and then there's this phone call. What now? Talk, you idiot! Look at the light! Isn't that the battery? I think that's the battery. Hello? Hello? Ah, <clears throat> sorry about this. Uh, my name is Sean, and uh, back there hey, Sean. is Rebecca, my partner. In crime. Hello. Bloody good work earlier. Honestly, I mean it. Delivering us all that data. It's really just too bad that our man on the inside was such a um. <laughs> uh, how 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 to put it? Fanatic. Fanatic is the best word, I suppose. <laughs> we take who we can get. Exactly. Exactly. Well put. Uh, we saw in John an opportunity to burrow deeper into Abstergo's cloud servers, and I'm not ashamed to say we took it. Uh, not realising, of course, that he was enlisting you to help him. And to blame, should anything go wrong. I suppose it all worked out very nicely in the end. Most of it, anyway. What Sean really wants to say is, if you're up for more hacking, we are too. John gave you level 3 security clearance before you died. You should use it. The assassins don't have the resources to pay you like the Templars do, but we'll make it worth your while. Ah, look, we should really cut it short, Max. 20 seconds. All right. Good luck. Cheers, mate. And top-notch work. Really top -notch. Give yourself a pat on the back. And, happy hacking. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna hack this computer. I wanna hack all the computers. Like, I know it's not really needed, and I'll skip me getting into it, but I really wanna get into them, so, jump cut. That one was interesting, the top and bottom were red. So you can't just go down the bottom up here at the top. Alright, what is this show? Uh, a market feasibility analysis commission for the purpose of determining the strength and weaknesses of acquired historical properties. Oh boy, that's from the Assassin's Creed Revelations from Assassin's Creed Embers. 
Uh, basically, if you look up Assassin's Creed Embers, Ezio's death, there was a phone app or iPad app or something that was called Assassin's Creed Embers. And one of the videos in there is Ezio's final moments. So, I found that a pretty good watch. Alright, so we got 12 more computers to hack. Let's see, where are they? So, there's three in here. Honestly, I don't really want to do them all. I don't think it's necessary. But we might find some cool stuff. Okay, here we go. That one took a while. I'm surprised. It's hard. Unlock the secrets of our past, the Moria Mess 2000 ABS log, uh, Animus. So it's basically just things about the Animus. That's always cool. Oh, it's Assassin's Creed 3 stuff. That's pretty nice. Early Animus things. Wow. Uh, Mum says Count Rosberg will take care of us now. So long as Papa and Uncle John work for him, uh, home is big, but Trebon is a small town. Mum seems happy. Elizabeth to Jane Wom, Jane Weston. Uncle John, everyone calls him Dr. D, says that not all five year olds can speak three languages or write as well as I do. I foretell a bright future for you, Lady Beth. I like reading, drawing, and writing poems, but mathematics are hard. John Francis, my brother, is better at calculations than I am. He is one year older. Papa wants me to get the same opportunity, opportunity as my brother. He says I am fortunate that not all young ladies have private tutors. I study hard to please him. We are fastening this evening, Master Kelly. Uncle John announces. Papa grins. I know what this means. They will be working all night again. After dinner, I run to the parlor and jump on Uncle John's lap. His beard, unlike Papa's, is all white and rough. I ask him to tell a story. Uncle John makes everyone laugh, even Papa, who is usually so serious. He, see, he says they have to work now. Mama tells me it's time to wear it. Pull the sheets over my head and listen to the low humming voices come from the study. I'm afraid of the dark, but not tonight. Not with Papa and Uncle John praying. Alright, this seems pretty long. I'm not going to read this. I think it's just, I don't know, maybe it's stuff from the past? I don't really know. This one? Yep, here's another one. Timestamp August 16th, 2013. The following audio clips were selected from over 160 hours of reel to reel tape found in the residence of the late Dr. Warren Vidic following his murder in December 2012. According to labels on the tape's canisters, these recordings were made over a 14 month period between 1980 and 1981 without the consent of their primary subject, Mrs. Eileen Bach, a colleague of Dr. Vidic's and the originator of Abstergo's surrogate initiative. Mrs. Bach is now deceased. It should be stated unequivocally that Dr. Vidic made these recordings illegally and of his own volition using wiretaps and hidden microphones. That Stergo Industries had no knowledge of his actions and disavows any responsibility for them. And we're live. Capacitators at full. Ease the signal in. A little more. You feel anything? Don't be timid. Double it. No, we're taking it easy. 20%. 30. Eileen, go easy. We're six past yesterday. And boost the inputs. Too risky. Not if we split the I.O. signals. 25%. He's up. Oh, okay. There. I see something. I... What is it? Mein Gott. I hear talking. You're... You're okay? Yeah, I hear a stimme. It's... It's German. My name is Miriam Kurz. I see a light. It's cold. Ich werde nichts sagen. There's a man with me. Mehr werde ich nicht sagen. 
Keep an eye on no fighters. Mein Name ist Miriam Kurz und ich bin eine Navajo. Das Hitlers Zwang, der macht uns klein. Noch liegen wir in Ketten. Doch einmal werden wir wieder frei. Wir werden die Ketten schon brechen. Eileen? Denn unsere Fäuste, die sind hart, ja. Und die Messer sitzen lose. Für die Freiheit der Jugend kämpfe, Navajos. <lacht> Switch off. Powering down. Kämpf, Navajos. Get her out of there. <lacht> Oxygen. Von der Valve. No. <lacht> no, Satish, I'm, I'm fine, really. Quit the heroics. Just breathe. Better? Yes. Yes, thank you. Did we get something? It'll take a while to pass. What did you see? It wasn't just seeing. It was feeling. Being. I was... I was scared. You were shouting in German? I think I was in Germany. I was in Germany, Satish. Good morning. Well rested? Exhausted. Yesterday was an incredible find. Seems so. What did it feel like? It's foggy, but I I relived the memories of a young German woman. Early 20s, I think. A man was interrogating me, looming over me and asking questions. He was shouting, but I was shouting back. And then this, this poem just came out, like a chant. Fascinating. I'm eager for you to hear the tape. Is it ready? Yes, we transliterated the data onto an audio file. It took all night to process the language. Spool it up. Of course. Have a seat. Judging by the subject matter and the setting, I'd say you landed somewhere in Germany in the 1940s, one or two generations back. During the war, I'd imagine. 1940s Germany? <laughs> that would be Miriam Kurtz, my ex-husband's mother. So she's not related to you in any way? God, I hope not. I'd hate to find out my ex-husband is also my brother. <laughs> well, if it was Miriam Kurtz, then we hit a home run. You tapped into someone else's bloodline entirely. <laughs> Should we celebrate? We'll listen first. Surrogate initiative, test session 23, July 29th, 1980. Host, Eileen Bock. DNA sample SB1970. It's a little garbled at first. This is you settling into the memory. Your name, say it. My name is Miriam Kurtz. Louder. My name is Miriam Kurtz, and I am never young. Where did you last see the artifact? Who holds it now? I'll say nothing. I've told you all I know. I don't believe that is true. Who has the artifact? Hitler's dictates make us small, and you're bound in chains. But one day again, we shall walk tall. No bind with us. Restrain. Enough. For hard our fists, yes, and lies at our wrists for you to be free. And that's where we pull you out. Whoa. What would it take to get a visual render of all that? Mm, months, unfortunately. It took 13 hours just to process the audio. Visual takes much longer. But Vidic is able to record audio and visual in real time. How does he do it? His subjects are exploring their own genetic memories. That requires much less processing power. Oh, hold on, sorry. Eileen here. Hello. You have 10 o'clock in Lillian's office. It's 10.13 now. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. Tell her I'll be right there. And tell her we have some good news. No problem. You in trouble? Ugh, the monthly progress report. I'm trying to be honest about our progress, but no matter how much I polish our facts, Warren Vidic swoops in, promising the moon for pennies, and gets ten times the funding for his Animus project. Well, we are using his Animus technology. He's the foundation. We are the skyscraper. Which is why he should be a tech lead, not a project director. <sighs> good work, Satish. It's incredible footage, really. Clear and vivid. And the subject was synced for a full 62 minutes. Came out speaking French after his last session. Passably fluent. And with full recall of everything he'd gone through. Sorry, sorry I'm late. I was reviewing some data. It's fine. Warren was just telling me about his first subject. Mr... No names. Call him Subject One. Confidentiality. And how about you, Eileen? What's your good news? Well, we did it. We synced with an unembedded memory. 
outside the bloodline. That's a first. Really? Satish was able to process the audio today. A short clip. You can hear it for yourself. Only audio? No real-time memory feeds like Vidic has? Well, that's the difficulty with surrogate genetic memory data. Because I'm viewing memories not embedded in my own DNA, we can't rely on my cognitive faculties to help me process the signal. All we can do is record the raw data and transliterate it later. Hold on. You're running this experiment on yourself? I am. It's going well. I don't like the sound of that. Look, the sample I'm using, the DNA comes from my own son. It's safer this way. Ah, good thinking. 50% of my son's DNA is also mine, which reduces the danger by a huge margin. Meaning, I can now explore the memories of people who aren't directly related to me on his father's side. But for brief periods of time, I imagine. Right. Just a minute or two so far, but we're getting there. Come by the lab and listen for yourself. I will, when I have a moment. Unfortunately, work beckons. Ladies? That man is colder than a San Francisco summer. Stay focused, Eileen. You both have important work to do. Obviously. But my work requires his animus technology. I feel a little caged in. That's collaboration, Eileen. It's how science works. I shouldn't have to remind you. I know. I'm just... tired. Stop by and see us today. We have a lot to share. If not today, then this week sometime. Thank you. Alright, that was interesting. My headphone was up because um, my mic... Oh, nice, the promo picture. My mic was up because I didn't want any sound interference getting in the way. So, I, w so I want to find number two. I want to find number two. Because I don't want to do all the computers, maybe. I don't really know. Um, it says there's four more left. <sighs> Stop it, I don't want to find number two. I want to get on with the story. <laughs> Fuck this. <laughs> Alright, let's get into the Animus, because I would love to find the rest, and I would love to do all the computers. But... come on... We've got enough background, we know a few things, like... They're not only able to get into bloodlines, and now we're able to get into other people's bloodlines, because they've had a kid. Um, and since that kid was inside of them, and also has their father's DNA, then the father's DNA is part of them now, and so they can go into, like, the father's ancestry for a couple of minutes, and maybe now, they can go in for, like, hours. Um... We know that they've been doing animus things like 2000s and stuff, and 1900s as well. And we also know a few other things, that they know about all kinds of artifacts, and probably have some of them, if they're lucky. Um, so otherwise, let's get into the animus. We're trying to find out what happened to Caroline. Great Inagoa, October 1722. This is the epilogue. Gentlemen, how do you find it here? It will work for us, but our goal must be to scatter our operations, to live and work among the people we protect, just as Altairi Ben Lahad once counseled. Well, until that time, it's yours as you see fit. Edward, Captain Woods Rogers survived his wounds. He has since returned to England, shamed and in great debt. But no less a threat. I will finish that job when I return. You have my word. <laughs> Evening, Anne. Edward? I'll be sailing for London in the next few months. I'd be a hopeful man if you were beside me. England's the wrong way around the globe for an Irish woman. Will you stay with the assassins? No, I haven't got that kind of conviction in my heart. You? In time, I. But my mind is settled and my blood is cooled. Sail ho! Coming into the cove! <laughs> Oh? Who's this? 
You're a good man, Edward. And if you learn to keep settled in one place for more than a week, you'll make a fine father too. Ooh, she was pregnant. Though I'm a little worried she died at birth. I spent it would come and all the harm that ever I've done. <laughs> Alas, it was to none but me, and all I've done. For want of wit to memory now, I can't So let me the parting glass. Good night and joy be with you. That was lovely. I wanted that song to finish, I'm sorry. Oh my god, that's a lovely ending. Um, Edward does get a son later on, obviously. It's Haytham Kenway. But, <laughs> the dick. <laughs> but, um, not really. Haytham, Haytham's cool, he's just a Templar. But... Father, did you always know how to sail a boat? The Jackdaw is a ship, Jenny. Not a boat. But did you always know? No. No, I learned after leaving Bristol. After you left Mother? Well, I didn't leave your... I didn't leave without saying goodbye, that is. It was an arrangement, you see, between your mother and me. She said you left her. She said you always talked about sailing a boat and making money in the new world. I did always want to sail a ship. That's true. But not for a lark. To support us. To take care of her and you. Not me. Mother said you didn't know about me. She said you worked only once a year and that she never knew where to find you. That's all true, and I'm sorry for that. If I'd known earlier, I might have come home. I hope that I would have. Well, you were busy. That's what I think. I was, but. That wouldn't have mattered. Can I steal your boat? Boat? I see no boat here. Do you? Oh, I mean ship, obviously. <laughs> I don't see the difference anyway. Ah, it's a very simple one, Jenny. A ship can carry a boat, but a boat cannot carry a ship. Why then, everything is a ship. Large and small, but for my toy boat, the one I take into the bath with me. <laughs> That's a clever way of seeing it. Is it hard to talk about Caroline, Jenny? About your mother? Mm, no. She passed so 
done years ago. I miss her, but it's all right. Was she in pain? I don't know. I don't think so. She was very happy for quite some time. Then, not so happy. I didn't see her much after that. Then, she was gone. I... I'm sorry. I'm sorry I wasn't there for you. It's all right. You're here now. And we're on an adventure. Uh, only a little one, I hope. I can't handle too many more surprises. You think we'll see a whale? Yes, there's a very good chance. Mm. And what about pirates? Will I see pirates? No. Not much chance of that, I think. Oh, uh, that's rather sad. I should have liked to have seen one. Tell you what, Jenny. As soon as these winds die a little, I'll let you steer the jackdaw. One little trick at the helm before sundown. Yay! <laughs> Miss Jennifer Kenway, may I introduce myself? Jennifer Scott, if you please. I'm sorry, I... I... Uh... My daughter was raised by her mother, Caroline, until she passed away some years ago. Jenny prefers to use her surname to mine. Ah, please forgive my ignorance. I will. She may not. Father, help me! This little rascal, however, is a Kenway. What's wrong, Haven? I can't see the stage. Up we go. How's that? Fine. But won't your arms tire? Hey, I'm not so old as that. But if they do, then we shall quit this posh gig and go and meet your mother for some chocolate and whites. How's that sound? Yes, please. Okay, hush now. Is that it? I'm really smiling right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> so yeah, that was Assassin's Creed 4. <laughs> sorry, I love the stream. <laughs> Yeah, I can't do it for long. <laughs> okay, that's it. Um, that was Assassin's Creed 4. <laughs> I love this game a lot. I'm not kidding. Um, now I think I should bring up one thing because I'll go on a rant about this game most likely because it's so wonderful. There's not much things that are bad about this game. If anything, the worst thing is the programming, the coding. When you're trying to walk, like run up a wall or go past certain parts of the ship and your character thinks you're trying to go somewhere else and it won't climb, or he literally jumps off when he's not meant to and you're trying to go somewhere else. I hate those moments, but I think it's mainly a mix between your camera isn't in the right area and you're not pressing the right buttons in the right direction. Because in the end, the game thinks you're trying to go that way because of the way you're pressing the buttons and the way your cameras are rotated. So I don't really blame the game as much, but at the same time, I feel like the game could be a little smoother. But otherwise, this game is really, really good. I love the boat swimming, uh, the boat piloting. I love the look of the game. I love the fighting. I love the fact that a lot of these moments can be all stealth. I do wish the game could be a little longer, like the story. I feel like that the observatory wasn't in it enough, um, like the using the crystal skull to spy on enemies and stuff, I feel like that wasn't in it as much. I I wish that could have been brought in, like, sooner, so maybe we could, um, I don't know, um, use it to track down enemies. Um, just a little bit, 
because that would have been pretty cool. We only used it once, and it failed. Literally just failed outright. Um, but I do admit that was a pretty good ending. And when I say that, I mean if you watched the 10 minute clip of me explaining what happened in my failed recording, where there was no sound, we meet up with Rona and we use the, we use the skull with the fake Lorina, um, Loniaro, oh, Loriana, Loriano, sorry, it's very hard to pronounce this name sometimes, Loriano, blood. We don't actually know it's fake at the time until we see a church. So we go to the church, um, and it turns out it's fake. Um, we didn't know that though at the time. <laughs> but um, wonderful game. Honestly, honestly, this game is just really great. Nine point five out of ten. The only reason I do not um, I don't do another point five would have to be I don't know why. I guess you could say the diving sections are my favorites. Though I don't really I don't really take off points for bits that I don't like. I take off points because, as I said. The coding was a little annoying, how the running up and the stuff like that, how he jumps off all the time, even though I'm pretty sure I'm pressing the right buttons half the time, that just takes up the point five. If that hadn't happened pr much, as much as it did, I'd probably rate it a 10. Honestly, this game is still a 10. Honestly, I just love it that much. But yeah, um, there isn't much else I can say about this game, but there is one thing I want to go into, and it's pretty funny, it's not really that, um, that's something big. But every time you kill someone, you can kill them in any way you want, and yet the f the the killing them moment will always be they get stabbed in the chest or something with a hidden blade. And I feel like that's... So for example, let's say we're in the Animus, and let's say we're going through an ancestor's memory, and let's go through the, let's go through the theory that we're controlling that, um, that ancestor and we can do whatever we want, but once we continue their story, their life, it moves on to something. Like for example, let's say we're hunting down a target. And we choose we want to kill that target by berserk darting him or shooting him in the head. And we do that. But in realistic, but being realistically, the person's memories that we're going through, they never heard, they never killed that person that way. So if we're going through their memory and we're meant to be causing that event to happen so we can see the aftermath and we kill them, we could shoot them in the head, we could berserk dart them, but in the end, it will show us them being stabbed in the chest because that's actually what happened. It's like, um, it's like, the best way I can explain this would be alternate realities. There could be a reality where we kill some with a gun, we could, there could be a reality when we actually throw them off the edge, I don't know what. But, there might only be one reality where we actually get answers from them. Because throwing them, throwing them off the edge, we can't talk to them anymore. But shooting them in the head or something, boom, they're gone. They can't talk anymore. That kind of thing. But stabbing them in the chest with a hidden blade would be, well, a way we could get answers. Because they're still living, but they're dying. And they can still talk. I feel like that's what Abstergo is doing. They're allowing us to have control over our ancestor. So we can see things for ourselves. So we can do things for ourselves. And we're not just watching a movie. But once we further the person's memories into a point where something big's happening, like we're killing someone and getting answers from them, it will show us how things actually happened. We will be able to kill them in any way we want, but in the end, it will show us the way that the ancestor actually killed them, in this case, with the hidden blade. So yeah, I feel like that's pretty stupid. I'm, and before you go, oh, but why are you saying it's just their memories? The reason I'm saying that's stupid is because the optional objectives. When, um, I can't really think of any examples, but that's Roberts. You kill Roberts with a hidden blade. That's what it shows you when you're talking to him. His chest is bloody like he got hit by a hidden blade. But the optional objective which gives you 100% synchronization. And keep in mind that would mean that you're doing everything the ancestor did because you're synchronizing with their memories everything they did. The optional objective told you to hang him with a rope dart. But yet when we see him in the cutscene he has no thing around his neck, like no tum, no chokeness, and even then, we wouldn't be able to talk to him then because he'd be either gasping for breath or he'd be hanging there dead. But yet, that is how we get 100% synchronization. Which completely ruins the, f the point of it. I get it, optional objectives are meant to be fun, but then why do them? Why make it that doing an optional objective gets us to be 100% synchronized? We're not being 100% synchronized, we're not doing everything that the Ancestor did. 
if anything, ob objective, um, one, um, optional objectives should be just a fun thing, and then there should be a secondary thing where it should just be called synchronization objectives. Like, there should be ways the ancestor did it, and then it tells us how they did it in, like, a small way, like, uh, maybe kill your target with a hidden blade, or maybe, um, wipe out all the guards before killing your target. I don't know, or don't kill any guards before, um, until you kill your target. Maybe those could be the 100% synchronization things, but in the end, that's what happens. I, I'm not trying to make a big deal out of this, I'm just trying to explain that the optional objectives tell you to do something, and they give you 100% synchronization as if you're doing the same thing your ancestor did, but then they didn't actually do that, they stabbed him with the hidden blade. I'm not sure if you guys understand what I'm talking about, but it's just really weird that they call that 100% synchronization when we aren't actually synchronizing. But because in the end, synchronizing is basically just becoming one with. It's it's sync. It's literally in sync. It's with one. It's, that's not the best example, but that's basically the best I can say it. Um, but yeah, off that rant, it's a great game. And I'm gonna try not to talk any longer because I always talk for I always talk along in the credits. Um, can I actually skip this? Yes, I can. Boomba. So yeah, that was Assassin's Creed 4. I do recommend playing this game for yourself, and I hope that having like 60-something episodes of this wasn't too much. But hopefully I did... Oh. Wait, what? I already got all these. Congratulations! Congratulations for what? You finished the game. New Relic, Portrait, Album, um, Emblem, and Title unlocked for the multiplayer. Why did it show all that stuff? I've already got all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, what? Uh, collectibles. I've already got all the collectibles, I reckon. Um, I would go back and get all, like, these golden, but I think since I've bet the game and I've got majority completion, like 95% complete, I reckon, um, I feel like that's not really necessary. So, yeah, I'm going to see how much completion I got, but otherwise, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I really enjoyed this game, but now I can get on some other games, and yeah, we got 95%, I was actually right, nice. I am going to play the DLCs, not in, like, for me it's not going to be anytime soon, but for you guys, it will be literally right after the series that I'll be uploading them. But yeah, that was Assassin's Creed 4, and I will see you guys when I start playing the DLCs. See you then. See ya! Do 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 do